One of the main reasons why we don't have enough money for retirement or to be retirement ready is because of all the money that we spend on buying cars. Now, is that a fact? You can type that in a chat box and let me know if, if that's true, if that's something you resonate with. One of the reasons why we don't have enough money in retirement is because of all the money that we spend on financing cars or financing equipment. Now, let's do a quick tally. May I ask you, you, for everybody in the chat box, just share a number. How many cars have you purchased in your lifetime so far? And when you think about the word purchase, what, what it means is paid cash for it. So if you paid cash for the car, that's purchased. If you finance the car, that's also purchased. But if you've leased the car, that's also purchased. So may I ask everybody to just put in the chat box, how many cars have you purchased in your lifetime so far? So for yourself, for your spouse, for your kids. So Sukman, what, what's what's the number? What are we getting? Sorry, but we have a lot of uh, more than one for everyone. So three, four, seven. We have a 20 plus. That's oh, probably the smart. record. That's a record. 12 plus and 20 plus again. Yeah. So a lot of cars. A lot of cars, right? So we go through cars a lot. Now, so you, thank you for sharing. So you shared how many cars you purchased in your lifetime so far. Now, here's something else that we got to do. We're not done yet. May I ask you to please share in the chat box what has been the average cost of buying that car? So over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, for, for whatever years you've been buying cars, how much was the average cost of the car? Please go ahead and share that in the chat box. And, and Sukman, may I want you to share that number, please? So we got 45 to 65K, 30, 45K, 40K, 30K, All right. 45. Well, yeah, a lot of 30 to 45, it seems like, sorry, Blow. Perfect. Well, guys, you're going to love my next question. Are you ready? Drum roll. How much of that money do you have today? So if you take, about, if you take the number of cars that you purchased and you multiply that with the total average cost of the car, it'll give you how much money you've spent on buying cars, whether it's cash, finance, or lease. May I ask you to share in the chat, how much of that money do you have today? Sukman, what's the number? A lot of zeros, sir. A lot of zeros. So right now, you're ready to smash your computer. Please don't do that because I'm not done presenting it. So the good thing is a solution exists. The interesting thing is you're not done buying your, your last car. So you still have a problem to solve, the problem of buying your last car using the conventional way and having that money flow away from your family. But the solution is still being able to buy the car and keep the money in the family. So don't smash your computer yet because I have a solution for you. Just stay tuned till the end. Now, everything begins with the way that you think. This is what Nelson has taught us. And this is the biggest lesson that I have learned after spending so much time with Nelson reading his book. And then he also goes on saying that many people would rather die than think. And in fact, most die. That's another fact. Now, on the bottom left-hand side, if that's you, and we think, right? It's, 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 it's a good habit to think. So we think, we thinking results in imagination. Imagination results in ideas and ideas don't work if you don't have strategies to implement those ideas and once those strategies are in place we take action on those strategies action creates an outcome now outcome is not good or bad outcome is just an outcome and then the whole process of thinking starts again now this needs to change this this thinking needs to change if we need to change the outcome in our favor because everything starts right here. So everything begins with how we think. And we're going to do a lot of thinking exercise today. I'm going to set some foundation before we dive into some solution mode. Now, may I ask everybody, what's your biggest asset? So share in chat box. I, 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 I said we're going to be participating a lot. So please share in the chat box. What's your biggest asset? So Sukman, what's coming up? We have home. Time and knowledge, myself, my car, my house, my Perfect. home, myself, and real estate. Awesome. Well, my wife may be listening to me, so I'm going to say my wife is my biggest asset. <laughs> but, so here, here's your biggest asset. This is one of the biggest asset. It's your ability to think. That's your biggest asset. Also, in addition to everything else that you have shared. So the process of becoming a banker is an exercise in imagination, logic, and reasoning. And all three components have to come together 
for you to make an intelligent decision of implementing this process in your life, personally or corporately, especially imagination and thinking. So in your own mind's eye, if I invite everybody to start thinking in your own mind's eye, think about your favorite restaurant, a restaurant that you will take your family to for a huge celebration. Now, you don't have to post that name of the restaurant in the chat box. I just want you to think about what your favorite restaurant is. And I know you have that name in your mind because you've been there several times. Now, why is that restaurant your favorite restaurant? Is it because the food is good? Maybe the, maybe that's the reason. Maybe you like the ambience. Maybe you like the service. Maybe combination of all that. And that's how you determine that's your favorite restaurant. Now, as you were thinking about your favorite restaurant, I bet you didn't think about McDonald's as a favorite restaurant. But yet... McDonald is the most successful restaurant on planet Earth. And why is McDonald the most successful restaurant? Is it because the burgers are so good? The burgers suck. I would say the fries are good. Now, the reason why McDonald is the most successful restaurant or one of the most successful restaurants, probably more successful than even some Michelin stars out there, because McDonald's did something differently that most restaurant chains don't even think about, right? So it's never what you do it's everything about how you do it. So it's it, so it's not about what you're going to buy in life. What you're going to buy are the things that you need in life, like food, clothes, vacation, kids' education, retirement, cars, grow your business, retirement, cash flow, whatever you need to buy in life, it's essential you have to buy it. So it's not about what you're going to buy in life. It's how you're going to go about buying it that's going to create the difference in, in your financial growth going forward. The how is the process. So that's why becoming a banker is a process. And that's the process which is going to enhance anything that you do today or that you're going to do going forward financially. So becoming your own banker is a process which will radically improve anything that you do financially. Now, here's another fun thinking activity. Now, let's assume that you have a, a GIC. Now, GIC stands for Guaranteed Investment Certificate. So for, for those who may not be familiar with GIC, so basically when you buy a product called GIC from a bank and you put money into it, you are contractually guaranteed the re return of your capital in, in the GIC plus the interest that the GIC is going to earn over the duration uh, that you pick for your GIC, whether it's three years or four years. So let's assume you have a GIC and you have $30,000 in GIC and it's earning you 8% per year, which is which is really, really good. GIC is not close to earning 8% right now, but let's assume that is happening for you, right? <clears throat> now, we all have the need for use of capital. So in this case, let's assume that you have the need for $30,000. You need this money to buy something. And, and here are your options. So option one is you can call the bank and say, I would like to withdraw the $30,000 out of my GIC, which is presently earning 8%. And you can take your money and then go use the money to buy whatever you're going to buy. That's option one. Option two is you can leave your GIC the way it is and let it earn 8%. And what you do is you use you use a GIC as collateral. You pledge this as collateral with a private lender and you take a private loan. So the private lender will give you $30,000, which is what you need to use. But the private lender is going to charge you 16%. And then terms are you have to make monthly payment of principal and interest and you have to pay this loan back in four years. So if these are your options, one is use your money which is presently earning 8%, or option two is use the private loan, $30,000, but then you have to pay 16% on that loan. So which option will you select? Do you want to use your cash or do you want to use private loan? So let's see in the chat box. Please share in the chat box. Do you want option one or you want option two? Sukhman, what, what are we getting in the chat box? So I'm getting... A lot of ones. Some people are picking two, but moreover, it's a lot more one circle. It's a lot more one, right? And then that's 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 human nature, right? Because we we are trained, our human brain has been trained to make decisions based on rate. And when someone looks at this transaction, they say, "Well, if if I if I borrow this money at sixteen percent and my GS is earning eight percent, 
well, I'm going to lose 8%. So I'm not going to take this deal or rather just take my cash and run with it because this deal just doesn't make any sense. So Bill, like, why are you proposing this? Like maybe you do math differently in Calgary. Well, let's look at the option. So let's assume that you actually selected the option two, where you had the GIC earning 8%, you plus that as collateral, and you borrowed money as a loan from the private lender at 16%. So let's do some math. So private loan, so you borrowed that money, $30,000, interest charge is 16%, loan duration is 48 months, that, that was a condition, and the monthly payment is $833, Total repaid is 40,028. So basically the interest paid to the private lender is 10,028 on this transaction. This math checks out. If you wanna go cross check it, please go for it. Now, while this person used the money from the private lender and yes, he had to pay 16%, but he didn't touch that GIC. So let's see what was happening to GIC. So the money in GIC, $30,000 was earning 8%. That never stopped growing. The compounding duration over the same time period, 48 months, the account value at the end of 40 years is 41,269. So the interest earned in GIC is 11,269. So if you summarize what happened, interest paid on private loan is 10,028, but interest earned in GIC is 11,269. So the teaching point is GIC at 8% over 48 months actually came out ahead financially beyond the interest that this person had to pay on the private loan and the private loan was at 16%. But those who selected option one, you, your mind must be thinking, hey, this, this logic doesn't make sense. How can I earn 8% payback at 16%? That just doesn't make sense from math standpoint. But when you actually do the the calculation, it perfectly makes sense. And here's the reason why. The 16% was a loan. And as they were making back a principal and interest payment, the principal was reducing the balance. And because the balance was reducing, the interest was being recalculated on, on remaining balance. So as they kept paying down the loan, the interest just got recalculated. The GIC was compound interest. So as time went on, they were earning interest on interest. So the overall came out ahead, right? Now the teaching point is not, hey, go buy GIC at 8% and plus that as collateral to get a private loan at 16%. That's not the teaching point. The teaching point is just to get a thinking or imagination going. You know, we, we're not gonna make decisions on rates going forward. We are gonna do our calculation and then make an intelligent decision if the deal makes sense, right? So if you believe in compounding, when do you want your wealth to stop compounding? So type in, in the chat, when do you want your wealth to stop compounding? A lot of never, Sarbo. Yeah, absolutely. We never want a wealth to stop compounding. Now, we are going to talk a lot about not just compounding. Compounding is something you're sim familiar with. We're not here to talk about compounding. Compounding is great. What we are here to talk about is the power of uninterrupted compounding. That's where the value is, uninterrupted compounding growth from now till the end of time. Now, another fun thinking activity. So who, who likes to increase their wealth or grow wealth? Just type in the chat box. So who likes to grow wealth? So just put in, oh, I'm getting a lot of me's, me, me, me. All right, just perfect, awesome. Everybody loves to grow wealth. So let's assume that today there's a super duper global equity fund. This fund doesn't exist but let's say this fund exists. Now this fund guarantees 25% average rate of return in four years. The keyword that I'm using is guarantee. So if there's a super duper global equity fund guaranteeing 25% average rate of return over four years, are you excited to put some money into it? Hypothetically speaking. So type in Y for yes and for no. Yes, perfect, yes, perfect, good, thank you. All right. Now let's invest $50,000. So we all invest $50,000 into this fund. So the initial investment is 50,000. In the bottom, you'll see the year. So year one, the fund did pretty good. We put in $50,000. The account value increased to 100,000, which is a 100% increase in account value. Year two, the fund didn't do that great. And we are down to $50,000. We haven't lost money, but the fund didn't do really well. And it's 50% reduction compared to year one. But year three, we, we go up to $100,000 and now we're super excited. So year three, it's back to 100K, which means it's 100% increase from year two. 
but then year four comes along and the fund doesn't do really well and they drop 50% as compared to year three. So this is what happened in the fund. And let's just do some tally work. So the initial investment was $50,000. The duration was four years. The account balance after four years is $50,000, right? As, as you all saw in the chat. Now the average rate of return promised was 25%. Now, what rate of return did you actually receive on, on, on this investment? Eugene says zero. Well, let's hear from some other folks here. Brad Brandt says zero. You're absolutely right. Neil, zero. John, zero. Kamlesh, zero. You're absolutely right. But what if I say to you, the fund actually made an average of 25% over the last four years? And again, you're thinking, hey, Sirupal, I thought you are an engineer. Like, what is happening to your math skill? I put in 50K after four years, I got 50K. Where is the 25% average rate of return? Well, here's, here's what happens. So first year, we have 100% 100, 100 increase in account value. Next year, 50% reduction. Third year, 100% increase. Fourth year, 50% reduction. So let's, let's do some math. So first year is 100%, so plus 100. Second year is minus 50. Third year is plus 100 fourth year is minus 50. So 100 minus 50 plus 100 minus 50 is 100%. The money was invested for 40 years. So 100 divided by four is 25% average rate of return. So what you were promised, you got, it just didn't happen. And this is the kind of stuff that happens out there if we work where things are based on average rate of return. See, ro roller coasters, I love roller coasters, but it's great for amusement and experience, not certainly for, for building wealth, right? When it comes to building wealth, I prefer to, to go up using an elevator because I know I will go up. <clears throat> so becoming your own banker is not about addressing a yield in investment. It is about how one finances the things of life, which can certainly include investments. It involves building wealth with certainty and contractual guarantees. And I'm putting that in on the screen, certainty and contractual guarantees. Now think about this. When you borrow money from the bank, how much risk does the bank have in that transaction? So how much risk does the bank have when you go and borrow money from the bank? Let's use, if you, borrow, you use an example of borrowing money for real estate purchase. So how much is the risk to the bank on that transaction? None. Neil, 100%, none. Because the real estate itself in this example is the collateral for the bank. And then in case we default on the loan, they can garnish our wages, right? So if you borrowed that money for investment from the bank, you took the risk, but the bank didn't take the risk. Now let's pick any bank. Now I'm gonna, I'm not here bashing banks, but let's just say one of the five big banks, you know, RBC. Now, if you go to RBC to, to borrow money for the purpose of buying real estate, they'll be super excited about it. They'll happily entertain you, provided you qualify for the loan. Now, if you go to RBC and say, I would like to borrow money to buy RBC stocks that you trade on TSX, RBC would look at you and say, sorry, we don't do that. I'm not going to lend you money, even if you want to buy our own stocks, because that's a high risk investment, right? So again, bank... The way the banking business works, banks lend money with security. They do not invest with risk. So the very same institution that, that believes in the fact that lending money with security is the best way to create financial growth going forward, they make us believe that investing money and taking risk is the best way to get ahead in life financially. So either the bank knows something and they're getting really rich or they're really stupid and following the same motto. Which one do you think it is, right? Again, not here to bash banks. Now let's do one more uh, fun thinking activity. When you get paid, where does the money go first? So type in the chat box, where, where do you think the money goes first? In the bank. So the bank sees your money before you see your money. You're right, it goes in the bank. And then you start using the money to buy the things that you need to buy. You know, We all need to exchange money for the purpose of buying the goods and services that we need. To, to make and, and, and then we, we got to purchase all those goods and services. So beginning of the month, we have a high account balance, but by the end of the month, what happens to your account balance? 
it goes down because you're using your money for the purpose of buying things. Look at this animation. Zook is gone. Now, who did all the work to earn money? You can put in the chat box, say, I did. You did all the work to earn money. But in the end, who got all of your money? Someone else did. Now, is that a problem? Now, if that's a problem, then the solution becomes clear, right? See, we're all familiar with the process called banking. The issue is not everybody is controlling it. Now, beginning of the month, we have our pot of gold. Let's just say that's a mortgage payment for the house. And then we have the same thing for the car payment. If you have appliances that we are financing, we got money for the appliances, house remodel, furniture, you know, credit cards, we pay for credit cards, family vacation, investments. So beginning of the month, we have all that money. And by the end of the month, all that money is transferred away to someone else, in this case, the bank. And all these transactions are liabilities now because the money is leaving you. And all we're talking about is for you to get that bank out of the picture and actually you become your own bank or you become your own private banking system. And if you become your own banking system, if you create your own private family banking system, then all those payments that you are presently making now come back to your system. So now all those payments, which were originally liabilities, now become assets. Because the asset is not the house, the car, the appliances, the investments. The asset is the stream of payment. And someone has to get those stream of payments. And who better than you to get the payments? So become a banker and have the banking function work for you versus against you. It doesn't matter what you what your financial goals are, whether it's to pay off debt, buy real estate, grow business, kids education, emergency funds, buy cars, keep taxes away from wealth, intergenerational transfer of wealth. Rather than taking your money and accomplishing all those objectives, take your money, put it into your system first, and then use your system to go buy the things that you need to buy so that you're always financially making progress and you're always recapturing and recycling the money back into your system. Now, here's another question. Who is the biggest thief in the world? Who do you think is the biggest thief in the world today? The government, CRA. We get that response all the time. Now, who here thinks that they're not being taxed enough? Anybody here thinks that they're not being taxed enough? Now, are taxes going down in future? Tax problem is probably going to get worse. So here's another exercise. Now, let's talk about tax-free environment and taxable environment. Now, let's say you have $20,000 that you're willing to invest per year for the next 20 years. And let's assume you're investing that money into something that's going to yield 4% per year. And, and let's also assume that you're in your 30% marginal tax rate. So if you're operating in a tax-free environment, 20,000 per year for the next 20 years at 4%, the, the account value at the end of 20 years will be $220,000. Sorry, that's gonna, that's the interest that you're gonna earn on the, on, on the investment, $220,000. Now, if you do the same thing in the taxable environment, you're still doing 20,000 per year for 20 years at 4%, but you, because you're paying 30% tax, your, your interest earned at the end of 20 years is gonna be $140,000. So tax-free will be 220, taxable is 140. Now here's something really interesting. If the taxable environment has to match what the tax-free environment did, in this case, the taxable environment has to earn almost 7% to match what the tax-free environment did at 4%. Now, here's a question for you. When now you have to chase a higher rate of return, four versus seven, what comes along with the higher rate of return just to match what the tax-free did? What comes when you're chasing a higher rate of return now? What comes alongside? It's the risk. So when you chase higher rate of return, it's not just the higher rate of return that you have to chase, it's also the higher risk that you have to manage. And the definition of risk is simple, it's subjecting something or someone to the probability of loss. So higher rates, higher risk, high probability of loss, yes, it's higher gains too, but it also has higher probability of loss. So again, 
tax-free versus taxable. When taxes go up, tax-free becomes even more valuable. And why am I talking about tax-free? Because that's one of the things that we're able to accomplish is to build our wealth on a tax-free basis going forward using the process of becoming a banker. Now, wherever wealth accumulates, someone or some entity will try to steal it. That's a fact. And by the way, CRA has no sense of humor. I have tried it. It doesn't work. I'm still waiting for a birthday card from them. I've given them so much money in taxes. Not once they've sent me a birthday card. Maybe you've received one. I don't know. Now, type in yes in the chat box if you want to shield your wealth from taxes. Lots well, of if yeses. you want to shield your wealth from taxes, then you're in the right webinar today. Now, becoming a banker is protecting your wealth against market losses. Becoming a banker is about protecting your wealth against taxes and, and fees. Becoming a banker is about protecting your wealth against losses due to interruption of compounding. Nobody talks about this. The biggest erosion of wealth is interruption of compounding in addition to market losses and taxes and fees. So we will we'll protect us from all these three major risks. Now, here's another question for you. When you borrow money from the bank, who dictates the repayment terms and conditions of the loan? Is it you, the borrower, or is it the lender, the bank, who dictates the repayment terms? A rhetorical question, answer is obvious, but again, we got to think. So it's you or the bank, and we know it's the, it's the bank who dictates the repayment terms. Now, has increase in interest rates affected your cash flow today? So type in yes if, if that's happened to you. Just put in Y or yes. Yes, 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 absolutely. I'm getting a lot of yeses. It's definitely impacted your cash flow. Now, was it just your cash flow that was impacted, or did it also cause stress, anxiety, fear, confusion, uncertainty, and change in plans? Cash flow was not the only thing. Nobody talks about emotions. This is emotionally how it's impacting you today. Now, here's something to think about. Is increase in interest rate or inflation the real cause of what you're feeling today? Or is it the lack on, of control on the financing function the real cause? Remember, everything begins with the way that you think. If you were the one controlling that transaction, that financing right now, you can just stretch out your amortization. Even if the rate goes up, your payment can stay the same. If you are the one controlling the transaction right now, you can take pay vacation from those payments and, and be in a stress-free way. But because you're not the one controlling it and interest rates have gone up, now it's negatively impacting you. It's not because of just the rates. It's also because you're not the one controlling it. We're going to put you back into the control position when you become your own banker in your life. But remember, everything begins with how you think. The problem is never the problem. The problem is always how we think about the problem. See, as time progresses, interest rates go up and interest rates go down. One thing continues no matter what. Any guesses what that one thing is? Let's see. Sukman, are we getting any? There you go. Calvin, John, thank you for sharing. Banking. Interest rates go up, interest rates go down. Market goes up, market goes down. But function called banking continues no matter what. And if you're not the one controlling the banking function in your life, then indefinitely you will negatively be impacted by it going forward. It's not the last time it's going to happen, right? <clears throat> now, do you want to achieve total and absolute control on finances? I would like to hear from everybody if today anybody in the webinar, you want to achieve total and absolute control on finances. And if you don't type in the chat box, I'm going to assume you're not interested in control. <laughs> all right. We're getting a lot of yeses, right, Sukman? Lots of yeses. And then someone says all day and twice on Sundays. Oh, I love that. I don't know who said it. You're my biggest fan or I'm your biggest fan too. So thank you for sharing that. All right. Um, then become your banker in your life if you want to have total and absolute control. When you become the banker in your life, you will radically improve anything that you do financially. The very first principle that must be understood is you finance everything that you buy. And that's a fact. You finance everything that you buy. You either pay interest to someone else when you're borrowing money from someone else as a loan, you go to pay interest on it. That's financing on borrowed money. 
or you give up the interest that you could have earned when you pay cash for things. Now think about, now cash doesn't mean physical cash. Cash doesn't mean today you got some, I got some USD in front of me. Cash doesn't mean you take this USD and then you go exchange this USD for goods and services. No, cash means debit also. Cash means credit also, and then paying off the credit card. I, I, I met with a client the other day and said, hey, when was the last time you paid cash? He's like, I think it was like five years ago when I paid cash, when I met my barber. I said, no, I'm not talking about physical cash. I'm talking about when you used your money to buy the goods and services that you wanted to buy, right? So when you use your money to buy the things that you want to buy, you are making a decision of giving up the interest that you could have earned. And that decision or that losing interest is not just over your lifetime, that's for next generation to come because when that cash is used, that money is gone forever. Paying cash is losing interest. Borrowing money via loan is paying interest. Now, who likes free money? Anybody in the webinar who loves free money? All of us do. I love free money. Now, if I give you $5 today, so let's just say I got $5. I'm going to use USD. And I take this $5 and I give it to you virtually. I wish I can do that. I basically have given up the opportunity to reuse that money. Now, how much of this money is now working for me? Well, I just gave up the answer. The answer is zero. This money is not working for me anymore because it's been transferred away from me. Now, if this money is not working for me, how much interest I can earn on this money? Well, the answer is zero. This cost of loss opportunity. So I'm I'm 40 today, and let's just say I'm going to live till age 80. That's 40 years. If I just make that one transaction of $5, it's not, it, it's not going to cost me $5. It actually costs me $36 because I could have invested that money and grown that money for the rest of my time on planet and converted it into $36. So I reduced my net worth in, in retirement time by $36 by paying $5 in cash. Now, if I pay 50 bucks in cash, then I'm reducing my future net worth by $360. And if I pay 500 bucks in cash, I'm reducing my future net worth by 3,600. And if I pay 5,000 in cash over the year, I'm reducing my future net worth by 36,000. And if I pay 50,000 in cash, then I have reduced my future net worth by $360,000. So now you can see how paying cash can be financially disadvantaged to you because that's what you are taking away from a future retirement pool of capital. And the more you pay cash, the bigger the problem. And again, nobody talks about this. There are no exceptions to the rule. You either pay interest or you give up the interest. Now, it doesn't matter which of these methods you adopt, whether you borrow money or you pay cash, you're not just permanently transferring your money away from you, you but, but the opportunity of reusing that money is permanently lost. Now, do you see that as a problem? Type in yes. Why for yes if you see that as a problem? Because if you see it as a problem, then I have a solution for you. So there's an old way of doing things, and then there's a new way of doing things. Obviously, the new way is the becoming a banker, the infinite banking concept. The old way is a traditional way of financing and paying cash. So let's look at the old way. So there's two kinds of people that we have. So one is a debtor. A debtor says that I just cannot save money. The only way for me to buy anything is by just borrowing money, going into debt and making stream of payments back. And the saver says, I hate debt. I just cannot stand paying interest to anybody. So I'm just going to save up the money that I need and I'm going to use my money to buy the things. And I'm going to be better than the debtor because I'm not going to pay interest to anybody because I'm not borrowing money. Well, on top, it's a debtor. So debtor always relies on debt. So they go into debt to buy whatever they have to buy, and then they start to make stream of payments back to the lender. And once the stream of payments are made back in full, they've accomplished the objective 100% of paying the debt, and this, they have the use of the money during this time to buy whatever they have to buy. But once they paid the debt, how much money do they have? And you can see they're back on zero. And then when they're ready to buy something else, they go into debt and they make those payments. And when they're done making those payments, they go back to zero. So again, they've used all that money. They transferred all that money. They got nothing to show for it is zero. And the situation continues 
it's always zero once they're done paying, right? They accomplish the objective of using someone else's money to buy the things that they want to buy. But once they paid the debt, all the money is gone and they're back zero. Now, saver, on the other hand, says, I don't want to get into debt, so I'm going to save money. So they start at zero and then they start saving money. Now, here's something important for you to understand. When someone shared this with me, it was an aha moment for me. Saving money is another way of payment because we're setting aside money deliberately for very specific objective. We are making payments into a savings account for very specific objective. And once we have the money, we'll take all that money, buy the things that we want to buy, and then we start all the process again. Saving is another way of making a payment. You just don't call it a payment. So when you save money, you're saving money, or you're making that payment as saving in someone else's bank. And once you have all that money saved, you take all that money, you buy whatever you have to buy, you accomplish the objective of buying whatever you need to buy, but all that money is gone, you're down to zero again. And next time for anything else you need, you start saving, you start setting aside that money as a payment called saving in someone else's bank. And once you have enough money, you take all that money and you buy the things. Yes, you do accomplish the objective of buying things that you need, but all that money is gone. And if you think about debtor and the saver, is there much difference in the outcome between debtor and the saver? The debtor at, is, is, is always coming at, uh, at zero line and the saver is also down to zero line. The debtor knows how much interest the debtor is paying on that loan because it's, it's there on the loan agreement. The issue is saver doesn't know how much interest they're giving up as an opportunity to earn because they, they may have not done the math on cost of loss opportunity. But it doesn't matter whether someone is a debtor or someone is a saver, whether you are a debtor or you are a saver, whichever between which, the, these two methods, whichever method you adopt, yes, you 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 keep getting the use of money to buy the things, but the money is always being transferred away from you, your family, your business forever. <clears throat> Now, here's something from Nelson's book, but it's William Shakespeare's quote, and, and, and I know you guys <clears throat> are familiar with William Shakespeare. Now, he says, <clears throat> all the world's a stage, and all men and women are merely players, right? You all remember that? <clears throat> now, this is from Nelson's book, and he uses uh, Shakespeare's quote to actually build on that, and he says, most people know there is a financial play going on out there in the financial world, but they don't understand it. And worse than that, they can't get the characters in the play straight. So here are the characters. So there are four characters in the financial play presently. It doesn't matter which transaction are you doing. There are four characters that are involved in that transaction. One is the depositor. The depositor is the money who... Deposit the person who just deposits the money in the bank. And you presently are a depositor. Your, your paycheck goes into the bank as a deposit, right? The second person is a borrower. You may have borrowed money from a bank as a loan. Uh, the third person is the banker. Now, banker is the individual who dictates the terms on the repayments of the loan. So he is the control freak in this transaction, right? Number four is the bank owner. Now, the bank owner is the person who receives the profits from the bank when banks become profitable. Uh, the profits may not go to depositor or the borrower. It only goes to the bank owner. So there are four characters in the financial play. These are the four characters. And if you want to have the money flowing back to your family, your business forever, you have to become all four characters in the financial play. And we'll definitely talk about that today. Presently, you're just a depositor and the borrower. We're going to make you the banker and the bank owner. And, and you all mentioned that you want to have total and an absolute control going forward. So if you want total and absolute control, you have to become all four characters in the financial play. <clears throat> Becoming your banker is not about changing your cash flow. It's not about working any harder. It's not about changing your financial goals. And it certainly doesn't involve losing control over your money. It's all about becoming these four characters in the financial play. Remember, every decision you make with the use of money is a financing decision. Now, let's talk about family bank. Now, before we dive into looking at case study on car financing, life cycle of car financing, it's important to get some perspective regarding the tools that we use to implement the process of becoming a banker. So we'll definitely chat about tools because any financial strategy needs a financial tool. Now, let's agree your money needs a warehouse, right? 
So if your money is sitting in your wallet, in your pocket, underneath your mattress, behind your toilet tank, it's it's a warehouse. That's where the money is warehousing. Maybe in a checking account, a savings account, your RSPs, a TFSA. It's it's a warehouse of money. So money needs to sit somewhere. Now, if you can warehouse your money inside an entity where your capital can never reduce in value, where it grows on daily basis, where financial turmoil in the marketplace doesn't negatively impact its growth, it's shielded from losses, where all the growth is tax-free and where it's readily available to access in case an opportunity shows up. So if you can warehouse your money inside an entity which has these attributes, may I ask how much of your money you don't want residing inside an entity like that? Please put that in the chat box, how much of your money you don't want inside an entity based on the attributes that I just described. Sorry about getting a lot of zeros. Yeah, you probably want all your money sitting inside an entity like this, right? Now, let me introduce you to that entity. That entity is called participating dividend paying whole life insurance. Those are the attributes I just described regarding participating dividend paying whole life insurance. Now, that policy is a tool. Now, I'm purposely showing you a Swiss knife on, on, on the picture because Swiss knife is, is a multi-purpose tool. No different than how Swiss Nest is a multi-purpose tool. It could be used for different things based on how the user or the consumer wants it. The, the participating dividend paying whole life policy is a multi-purpose tool and it can be designed in so many different ways based on your unique needs, based on your unique situation. So it's all customized. That's why it's important to have that one-on-one -on -one discussion with a coach on a team and authorized infinite banking practitioner. And I'll share with you how you can schedule that complimentary no obligation, no commitment from the call, but you have an opportunity to connect with someone on the team so that you can discuss how this can work for you and your family. Now, why this tool? Now, the reason why we use this tool is because it allows us to become all four characters, as I mentioned, so that we can have total and absolute control. Now, this is a perfect tool that has also all the attributes required for recapturing interest. Again, I talked about recapturing interest beginning of my talk, and I'll share with you the the essence of recapturing interest in, in the case study. Now, a participating dividend paying whole life uh, policy has a few components. So first is premium. Now you may have some sort of insurance product today, whether it's car insurance, crop insurance, health insurance, maybe you do have life insurance also. So one thing that's common in all insurance product is, is premium because that is what you pay for the insurance company to, to give you the benefit. So in exchange for a premium, they'll give you the benefit. So, so that same thing applies there. It's it's premium is there. Now, if you think about premium, if I if I may help you just you know rethink your thinking. So think about premium as a deposit into your banking system. So and so if it's a deposit into your banking system, then premium is what you want it to be. If you put 100 bucks a month in a bank for 12 months, you'll have $1,200 at the end of 12 months. Now, if you decide to increase that deposit to 200 bucks per month and you do that for 12 months, then you'll have 2,400. So you decide how much you want to put in. And based on this example, the more you put in, the more you'll have. So premium is what you want it to be. Now, that benefit, it is life insurance. And, and that benefit is just what it is. It is a benefit that is paid on, on debt. When the life insured becomes an angel, that death benefit is paid tax-free to the named beneficiary. <clears throat> now, the other component is cash values. Now, cash value is your capital. And, and you're going to see as, as I go through my presentation, that cash values are contractually guaranteed to grow on a daily basis. Every day you wake up, your cash values will increase. So cash value is your capital. Now, the last component is dividend. So the word participating dividend paying means by virtue of you owning this policy, you're not just owning a policy contract, you're actually co-owning the insurance company business. And insurance company <clears throat> is a business, it's not a charity. And purpose behind any business is to do one thing and one thing alone, which is to be profitable for the owners of the business. So anybody who has a participating dividend paying whole life policy will share in divisible profits from the insurance company. And it's all based on contribution principle. The higher the premiums, the higher the contribution, the higher the dividends, it's all relative. 
uh, insurance companies in Canada, uh, just for trivia, they have been paying dividends to policy owners, <clears throat> participating dividend paying whole life policy owners since 1848 every single year. Now, today we are 2023, and since 1848, they paid dividends. That's over 170 plus year track, track record of paying dividends. Now think about all the recessions, depressions, the pandemics that we have experienced just in our lifetime, but then expand it to the last 100 plus 170 years. So over all those years, they have been profitable because an a business cannot pay dividends if the business is not profitable, right? So they must be doing something really good. Now, if someone, I'm, I'm going to say this also, if someone has a million bucks and they say, hey, insurance company, seems like you do a pretty good job of producing profit. Here's my million bucks. I want to share in the profits of the insurance company. Insurance company would, would, would say this to you in a good humor. They say, we don't want a million bucks. If you want to co-own the business so that you can get some profits as dividend, all you got to do is buy a participating dividend paying holder policy. And that's what it takes to have an ownership stake in the business so that you can get dividends. <clears throat> so again, premium is a deposit. It's what you want it to be. The more you put into your policy as premium, the more compounding on the policy you'll have for the rest of your time on planet Earth. So premium is a deposit. Think like a deposit. Now, premium is the solution to the problem. The problem that we're solving is taking over the banking function in your life personally or corporately. And think about all the money that you owe to someone else, aka bank. And it, if it's a lot of money, which means you got to build your system to a point where it can control that function for you. And the only way you can accelerate that timeline is actually putting a lot of money into the system. It's all relative, right? So, so again, premium is a solution because it creates a bigger pool of capital to, to use to control more of banking function going forward. Now, premium is a cap is, is is capitalization. So when you put money into it, that's basically capitalization. You're capitalizing your business. You're starting something from scratch that never existed before. So you got to capitalize it. And then capitalization has to be very intentional because when we set up these policies for clients, we are working backwards from a very desired outcome, which means we're working towards a clear financial goal. Financial goal could be, hey guys, I want to be able to access $50,000 a year from today, because I'm going to take the $50,000 and go buy an equipment or go buy real estate or go pay off debt. So those are just, that's just an example of clear objective and then working backwards to seeing, okay, how much we can put, how much we should be putting in today to make sure that objective is met. Now, death benefit, like I mentioned, is, is just what it is. It is benefit. It is received tax-free by the named beneficiary upon the death of uh, insured. I say this in good humor, you know, financial planning will be so much easier if you just know the best before date that we have. So if you just know the day, the date that we're going to leave planet, we can just work backwards and, and create a financial plan. But here's another fact. We all have a best before date stamped on our back. We just don't know what that date is, right? <clears throat> so at some point in future, it's not if, it's when we're all going to die one day. And that's when the death benefit is going to come walking in tax-free. And if you live a long life, then you're going to be financially fine because you'll be able to control your banking function over the life cycle of, of the remaining of your life. Now, cash value. So cash value is, is what you can uh, borrow against uh, as a banker. And cash value is basically, basically your capital, uh, and it grows on daily basis. So every day you wake up, your cash value goes up. And the contractual guarantee is that total cash value of the policy must equal total death benefit by age 100. So for example, if, if someone buys, let's just say, X amount of death benefit on the policy, and they're just starting the policy today, every day they wake up, the cash values will increase because by age 100, cash values must match the death benefit. And the way we design policies is that your debt benefit actually is a moving target. Every year, or in some cases, every month, the debt benefit increases. And when that benefit increases, it positively increases the cash values even more. So the policy is designed to increase the debt benefit because the more debt benefit we grow, the bigger the cash value becomes. And cash value is a capital. And I want to just emphasize the difference between capital and money. Now, if you think about gold and silver, now, gold and silver are capital assets. It's not money. 
it can be converted into money or whichever medium of exchange that we have if we borrow against gold or silver or if we sell gold and silver, but gold and silver is capital. No different than that, cash value is capital and it could be converted into medium of exchange, whatever the medium of exchange is, is available on demand. And you, the policy owner, can actually uh, determine that, not the insurance company. You have full control on it. The cash value is growth tax-free. And cash value, again, is not money, it is capital. And it's available on demand to policy owner. Now, you can access 90% of cash values via policy loan. And if you access money as a policy loan, your cash values will continue to grow and compound uninterrupted as you're able to access insurance companies' money to put their money to work while your money continues to grow in the policy, right? So the question that I asked earlier is, if you believe in compounding, when do you want your money to stop compounding? And everybody said, no, never. We never want our money to stop compounding. Hence, our preferred mode of accessing capital is always policy loans. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Now, dividends. Now, you become the owner. So div dividend is basically your share of dis divisible profit from the insurance company is based on contribution principle. The more you put into policy as premium, the more you're going to have as uh, profits from the insurance company with dividend. And when policies are structured properly, that's Obviously, our number one um, objective is to structure policies properly to implement this process. Uh, dividends will be tax-free, provided the policy structure pro properly. Now, policy is not designed to maximize dividends. One question that we get all the time is, hey, I want to get the most dividends. That's not the best way to design policies. The policy is designed to, to, to grow the death benefit. The bigger the death benefit, the more you grow in the death benefit, the more cash flows you have. The more you grow in the death benefit, the bigger your dividends get. And if you roll those dividends back into policy to increase the death benefit, then it just becomes even better going forward. So the policy is never designed to maximize dividend. Think about dividend as an icing on the cake. You know, do you like cake? I love cake and I'll eat the cake if there's no icing, but it just makes it better with the icing, right? So it is the, the policy is designed to maximize your behavior and your behavior is the premium because that's what you control. And, and the, it's, it's structured in a way that premium will increase the size of that benefit going forward so that you have more cash value growth and you have more dividends going forward. Uh, but it's designed to maximize your behavior, not the insurance company. Now, you have family income. Technically, if all your money today is flowing to the books of someone else's bank and you're okay with it, when you become your own banker, should you not be putting all your money into your bank? Well, the answer is yes, but we can't stop there. We, we, we get there. We don't stop there. So family income after expenses, let's just say it goes into policies. And I'm showing just as example, three policies, maybe husband, wife, and, and a child, because we want to diversify in life insured, you know, in the family, nobody, you know, everybody... Everybody has the best before date. Nobody has a, a lease on life. So you want to make sure that there's life insurance in the family. So now we create family banking systems. Now premium in the family banking system does one thing and one thing alone, which is it buys that benefit. The moment it buys that benefit, it creates, because of contractual guarantee from the insurance company, there's cash values. And because there's cash value, there's also policy loans. So policy loan is 90% of cash value. And as time progresses, the cash values will keep increasing. And because cash values are increasing, your access to capital via policy loan will also increase. And cash value is increasing to match the death benefit by age 100. So every day you wake up, your cash values go up. And the policy is designed to increase the death benefit. So when death benefit goes up, it pulls the cash value even better going forward. The cash value growth becomes better when death benefit increases. You can see that. Now, points to note, when stock market goes up, cash values go up. When stock market goes down, cash value still goes up because it's inside a contract which has a contractual guarantee that by age 100, cash values must match the death benefit. So stock market can jump off the Mount Everest tomorrow, but the cash values will still go up. Crypto goes up, cash value go up. Crypto goes down, cash value go up. Teaching point is whatever, what happens outside in the financial world doesn't impact what happens inside the policy. Interest rates go up, cash values go up, interest rates go down, cash values still go up. I think you get the point. Now, here's the solution. By becoming your own banker, you become a wealth creator. So think about this Think about this green line as a cash value. It's increasing every day as you wake up to match the death benefit by age 100. And when you need access to capital, you get to borrow against this growing pool of capital as a loan. 
And then once you borrow this money as a loan, A, there is no qualification or anything like that to access this money. And you can repay the loan on your terms. So when you repay the loan back, you, you, you're able to go back to the policy and actually access more than what you had accessed originally. And then at point number two now, if you access money, you repay that loan back on the terms. And now when you're done paying the second loan, you're able to reaccess more than what you accessed the second time and the first time because you're paying into a growing pool of capital. You pay back on your terms. You can stretch the amortization to whatever you want to stretch it to. Uh, and you, you don't have to qualify for the loan. And the cash flow keeps growing tax-free. So let's look at a case study. We talked about car financing. Now, before we dive into case study, here's fundamental four steps of banking that I'm going to follow in this case study. So number one is deposit money. So we got to deposit money. You are a depositor. So now we're going to deposit money into our, our banking system. We are premium. So that's the first step. Number two is to borrow money. So because we're going to use the system to buy the car, we're going to borrow money to go buy a car. So that's a borrowed money. That's the borrower. Number two. Number three is we're going to repay the money because we want to be an honest banker. If we have no issue paying someone else's bank, why should we have an issue paying back to the bank? Now think about this. If you're the banker today, your biggest asset is the stream of payment. And if you start a banking business, you need to have stream of payments coming back. So no different than how you would be paying someone else's bank, make sure that you pay your bank back. Because nobody is going to come after you if you don't pay back the loan. you got to be an honest banker. Uh, and then, obviously, we're going to create profit. It's certainly not going to be profitable if you are not going to be an honest banker, right? So, me, Jack, I'm pretty sure you like this picture. You can see how much he loves cars. So, Jack, he's 36. And the cars that he's going to buy, so let's assume that Jack is going to buy seven cars. The value of each car is $30,000. Uh, he's going to buy seven cars over his lifetime. So from age 36 all the way, I think, till age 77, he, he buys his last car at that time. So his first car, he starts at age 37 and his last car. OK, so his last car, he purchases at age 73. So from age 37 till age 73, that's life cycle on car financing. So his objective is to finance cars using the system. He wants to buy seven cars. He wants to keep the money with him going forward. He wants to recapture the stream of payments, no different than how he would have those payments going to someone else's bank. And by doing this, he also wants to accomplish the objective of being retirement ready. So the process is to buy the car and the byproduct is going to be that he's not just going to have the cars and the stream of payments coming back. He's also going to set him up for success in future when it comes to retirement ready. And you're going to see that. So method of purchase. So he's going to use policy loans. Now, here's some yes or no questions and that I would like everybody's participation. So Sukhman, let's get folks participate in the chat. So when Jax initiates a policy loan to buy the car, may I ask whose money is it? Is it his own money or is it the insurance company's money? All right. So in the chat, we have a lot of insurance companies. So, yeah, yeah a lot insurance of insurance company. company. Perfect. Policy loan is insurance company's money. So if you guess insurance company, you're right. His money will be inside the policy growing every day. Now, here's another question. Does Jack need to qualify for the policy loan? Yes or no question? Lots so, of no's. Lots of no. Perfect. You're right. Smart group. No, he doesn't have to qualify, which is fantastic. Do you have to qualify when you borrow money from a bank to buy a car? Something to think about. Now, does Jack... Where do you... Okay, does policy loan get reported to Equifax or TransUnion? Yes or no question? Same thing, Sarvlo. Lots of no's. Man, you guys are good. Policy loan doesn't get reported to Equifax or TransUnion. Does your car loan get reported to Equifax and TransUnion? So ask yourself this question. Am I negatively impacted if the loan doesn't get reported to TransUnion or Equifax or I'm positively going to benefit from it? Are, th are keeping things private important for you in, in today's environment? I think so. Now, who controls the repayment terms of the policy loan? Is it the insurance company or the policy owner? Policy owner, sir. That's the, that's the resounding owner. answer. Yes. And because it's policy owner, that brings the total and absolute control. Because interest rates can change. 
But because they have full control and repayment, they're going to manage their cash flow and they're not going to be stressed with negative cash flow going forward because the interest rates have changed. Now, here's another question. Does outstanding policy loan balance impact daily cash value growth or future dividends? It's a yes or no question. Sakman, what's happening? <clears throat> Lots of no's. Yep. Perfect. Good. Absolutely. Now, does outstanding policy loan balance impact that benefit? Yes or no question? If your answer is yes, you're right. Uh, so add that any outstanding policy loans, are, they're deducted from the death benefit and the rest is paid to the family tax-free. But while they're alive, the death benefit continues to grow. Uh, it has no impact uh, because the policy loan outstanding. It's just when death occurs, the net proceeds from death benefit is paid to the um, named beneficiary, subtracting the policy loan balance. Now, does insurance company charge interest on policy loans? That's a yes and no question. Let's see who gets this one right. Lots of yeses for this one, Sargo. Yes, more group tonight. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And they should charge interest in policy loans because that's one way for them to make profit. Think about it. If you and me are in business together with Sukman and I come to you and I say, hey, guys, we own this business together. We have a lot of capital in it. I want to access them capital, but I don't want to pay any interest on it. You and Sukman are going to fire me from the business because I'm beating the purpose behind why the business got started, which is to be profitable. So insurance company says, if you can deploy this capital somewhere else and own a profit for you as the owner, why should we give this money to you for free? Capital has a cost, but you can pay back the loan on your terms. And here's what we're going to do. We're not going to interrupt the growth of your cash values, right? So four steps of banking. So here's what the client did. He deposited premium. So 20,000 per year. That's what worked for him. 20,000 per year. Now he borrowed money. So Car loan is $30,000. So he took $30,000 for for each car. He wants to buy seven cars. And it was a policy loan. And current interest rate is 6.5%. Isn't that lower than the bank today? <clears throat> and then he repaid the loan back as a banker. And, and what worked for him from his cash flow was a loan repayment of $500 per month, which is $6,000 per year. And that's what he used to repay the loan. And then obviously you create a profit, which you're going to see. And his profit is going to be retirement ready, plus the objective of buying all these seven cars going forward. So first car. So let's get started. All right. Now, here's something I would suggest everybody to do. So if you're joining us on one of these teeny mini devices, may I ask you to please flip it over on the side so that you have a better, bigger, better view. Uh, this mode doesn't give you the best view. Thank you for that. All right. So let's get started with the first car. Now, here's here's the policy. So you're going to see the policy. Now, he is 36 when he's starting. So you can see the first column is year and age. So one, two, three, that's policy year. And then the second is age, 36, 37, 38, 39, so on and so forth. Uh, the second column is premium. So you can see $20,000 going in for seven years. Now, premium, as you can see, never goes up. Premium can go down. The policy owner can elect to reduce the premium, but it can never go up. So 10, 15, 20 years from today, if inflation goes up and cost of running insurance companies' business has gone up, they cannot go back to the policy owner and say, hey, for us to not give you the same benefits, you have to put more premium in because the cost of running the business has gone up. That cannot happen. The premium stays the same. It cannot go up. Now, cash value is their capital, and you can see the cash values are increasing as time progresses. And the reason why the cash value cash values are increasing is because cash value has to match the total death benefit by age 100. So we've designed the policy to increase the death benefit, hence the cash value is increasing because cash value and death benefit have to match by age 100. Now, year two, he's got about $36,000 in cash value and, and he's ready to buy his first car. And the value of car is $30,000 and he initiates a policy loan to buy the car. Now, what he can borrow as a policy loan is 90% of the cash value. So you can see there's more than enough cash value to, to sustain a policy loan of $30,000. When he takes this policy loan for $30,000, insurance company will use his cash value as collateral. They're not gonna reduce his cash values. Cash value is just the collateral. All the cash values are gonna grow uninterrupted uh, and then they'll put a lien on his death benefit for the policy loan. So in case death occurs, 
and any policy loan was outstanding, they'll deduct uh, the policy loan outstanding from the death benefit and the family gets the remaining money. And this money gets deposited between seven, let's just say five to 10 business days, the money is in his bank. So when he took that money to go buy the car, he used insurance company's money, but the lien for the loan is his future dead self, his death benefit. So technically when he used insurance company's money to buy the car, he owns the car free and clear not using his money, using insurance company's money. And if you own a car in free and clear, then yeah, certainly you can get better rates on the insurance. But if you're paying cash for a car, you may be able to also negotiate a, a good price. In this case, is cash from the insurance company. Now, so, so he went ahead and paid cash for the car. He's, he's bought the car. And now he's being an honest banker and he decides to pay back his loan. So 500 bucks per month, 6,000 per year. And he's going to make a loan repayment for six years. So you can see one two, three, four, five, six. So 6,000 per year for six years, that's 36,000 in loan repayment because he's paying also the entrusted insurance company, which is 6.5%. He borrowed 30K, he repaid back $36,000. All right, so he's bought the first car, he's repaid the loan. Now let's do some math on the back end to see how much was the cost to him to buy the car using the system and was it worth it? Now let's calculate cost of buying first car using the process of becoming a banker. Now cost of buying car in this case is simple. How much money did he pay to the insurance company or how much money did he give the insurance company, which is the premium because premium is what he paid to the insurance company and the policy loan repayment is also what he paid to the insurance company. So that's how much money he gave to the insurance company. And then basically cost of buying cars, money in, money out. And money out is what he took out to buy the car as a loan, which is $30,000. So if you do money in minus money out, that basically gives us how much did it cost for him to buy the car using the process of becoming a banker. So let's calculate money in. So money in is the premium for this first seven years. So 20,000 every year for seven years, that's $140,000. That's what he gave the insurance company. And then the loan repayment, which is $36,000. So money in is premium plus the loan repayment. So 20,000 multiplied by seven years plus 6,000 multiplied by six years. So total money into the insurance company is $176,000. That's what he gave to the insurance company, right? Now, what he took out from the policy as a policy loan is $30,000 to buy the car. That's the money out. So money in is $176,000, money out is $30,000. So cost of buying a car using the system, $176,000 minus $30,000, it's $146,000, right? So everybody is okay with the math, right? So $146,000 is what costed him to buy the car. Now let's see what happened in the policy. So by year seven, age 42, that's when he's done paying for his car loan, right? So he started his car loan at age uh, 37, year two, took him six years to pay off the car loan. So at year year seven, age 42, he's done paying for the car. Now let's calculate, um, does this make sense for him to buy the car, right? So cost of buying cars, 146,000, money in, money out, which we did. Now, how much cash values does he have at the end of year seven when he's done paying for his first car? So cash values at the end of seven years, 153,237. So if I take 153,237 and I divide it by how much it costed him, let's do some math. So 153,237 divided by 146, 146,000 and express that as a percentage, it equals to a dollar and four cent. So basically for every $1 that he spent on buying cars, he has access to 104% of that dollar. And, and all he's done is he's just changed the process to buy the car. Now, here's a question for you. So again, for him, every $1 that he spent on car, now he can access a dollar four. Now for every $1 you spend on buying car today, how much of the money you can reaccess? So is he financially ahead by buying cars and all he's doing is changing the process to go buy the car? Type in Y for yes, if you agree. Lots of Ys. Now, let's get to the second car because remember, he's going to buy seven cars. So we talked about the first car and first car is more like capitalization, right? He's just getting started with his banking business because he's banking is a business and he just started a business from scratch. 
And even in the first car, he's still producing a great profit. He had the use of the car. He can still sell the car after seven years to someone else and have that additional profit. But on the transaction of financing, he came out ahead financially while he was just in that capitalization phase. Now let's start, let's talk about the second car. Now, every few years he's gonna buy a car. So every you know, six years he's gonna buy a car. So let's go to policy uh, at uh, policy year eight and he's 43 now and now he's buying his second car. Now something magical is gonna happen uh, when, when he reaches year eight, age 43. And the magic that happens is you can see there's no premium. But insurance companies need premium from somewhere to keep the policy in place. Otherwise, all bets are off. So the way they're the way the client in this case is, is paying the premium is actually from the policy itself. So the dividend is paying the premium now, and, and whatever is not in the dividend. And so, for example, if his I'm just using this as example, if his premium is five dollars. Right, and his dividend is two dollars. Well, dividend is only two dollars. Premium is five dollars. It's not enough to cover the premium. So the top up comes from his death benefit. So you're going to see that his death benefit gradually starts to go down temporarily, just to top up what is not in the dividend to cover the premium. But as time progresses, the dividend will cover the premium and beyond that, and the death benefit will start to go up again. So you're going to see that the death benefit in the policy is, is going down from year eight onwards, which, which will happen because he's not paying the premium, but what has happened to his cash values? Are his cash values going down or cash values still going up? And the reason why that is happening is because he's not age 100. He's still around age 47, between age 43 and age 47, and hence the cash values will still grow to match the death benefit by age 100. So that contractual guarantee will happen. Now he starts, he buys a second car. So at year eight, he's got 161,305 in cash value. That's there's more than enough money to buy a second car because he, he wants to just stick to $30,000 in car. car. Car is not really an asset, right? So he just wants to buy what he wants to buy to go from point A to point B. But the real asset is the stream of payments. And because he recaptured the stream of payments in the first car, he came out financially ahead. He converted that liability into an asset. And let's see what happens in the second car. So he takes out a policy loan for 30K. And again, insurance company uses his cash value as collateral, puts a lien on the death benefit, which is now 821000 And he pays back the loan exactly how he did for the first time. So again, he's not changing his objective of buying the car. He's not changing his cash flow to repay the loan. He's just changing the process to, to get to his objective. So the car loan repayment started at year eight. And by year 12, he's done paying the car loan. Now let's calculate between year eight and year nine, age 43 to age 44, how much did his cash values increase? So from year eight to year nine, his cash value increases 9,016. So year eight to year nine, year eight to year nine, cash value increases 9,016. Now let's see how much was a loan repayment to the policy at year eight. So you can see at year eight, he paid back a policy loan of 6,000, but from year eight to year nine, the cash value growth is 9,016. Now, here's a question for you. Are you going to be mad at me if you're able to pay back $6,000 and gross $9,000 in cash values? Is that going to bother you if that happens? Right? Something to think about. Now, let's talk about cost of buying the second car. And the formula stays the same. Money in minus money out. That's a formula, right? How much we put in, how much we take out. The difference is how much it took as a cost to buy a second car. So money in for the second car is... Just the loan repayment. That's all he paid the insurance company. There was no premium that he paid the insurance company. So his money in is only the $36,000 $36, as loan repayment. So again, money in is premium plus the policy loan repayment. There is no premium. So the only money in is the $36,000. So his money in is $36,000. Now, how much is the money out? He took $30,000 to buy the second car. So that's right here. Money out is $30,000. So money in for second car is 36,000, money out is 30,000. So here's his real cost now to buy his second car, which is $6,000. That's what costed him to buy his second car. Now let's calculate from year eight till year 12, because that was a timeline for him to buy this car and it took him $6,000 as a cost during that time. So let's calculate between year eight and year 12, how much did his cash value actually increase? His cost is $6,000. But his cash value increase from year eight to year 12 is actually 35,420. 
So are you okay paying $6,000 in cost of buying a car using the system and grow 35,000 for 20 in cash values and still have the car, which you own free and clear as an asset, which you can sell if you wanted to? Let me know if this doesn't make logical sense. So again, cost is $6,000, time period eight to eight, year eight to year 12, age 43 to age 47. The cash flow growth is 35,420 and plus he had a car. Now let's do cumulative math. So how much was the total cost to buy the first car and the second car? So cumulatively, let's do, let's do that math. Now the math is simple, right? Money in minus money out is the cost of buying two cars using the system. So money in for car one and, and money in for car two, we'll add it together and then we'll subtract it from money out. And we'll go back to those calculations again. So again, this was the first car that we went over. So money in was the premium for the first seven years, as you see, and then the loan repayment for the first car, as you saw. So money in for the first car is premium plus the loan, which is $176,000. And money in for the second car is just the loan repayment because there was no premium. So the money in for the second car is 36,000. So total money in for two cars cumulatively is 176,000 plus 36,000, which is $212,000. That's basically how much he paid or gave to the insurance company for, for two cars using this process. Now the money out for two cars, so 30K for the first car, 30K for the second car. So he took out $60,000 to buy two cars. So again, cost of buying two cars, money in minus money out. So 212,000 minus 60,000, it's $152,000. That's what it cost him to buy two cars. Now let's fast forward to when he's done paying for his second car. So at year 12, age 47, this is when he's done paying for a second car. His How much cash values does he have at year 12? So his cash value is 196,726, right? So this is his cash value. We've, we've captured this. Now his cost of buying two cars cumulatively is $152,000. So if I take 196,726, which is his cash value and divided by $152,000, so 196,726 divided by 152,000 expressed as a percentage, that's a buck 29. So which means for every dollar that he spent on financing two cars from his banking system, he's now able to access 129% of that money. Again, car is a depreciating asset. He just converted that into an depreciating asset just by changing the process. And let's not forget there's death benefit. So God forbid, as he was driving the car, he took a wrong turn, got hit by a bus, the family would get the death benefit minus the outstanding loan and the family is gonna be fine financially also. So again, where are you getting 129% for every dollar that you spend on two cars? Think about that. For every dollar they spend on two cars cumulatively, now they get access to $1.29. So again, becoming a wealth creator works. This process of becoming a banker works. And it doesn't matter where you get started. From premium standpoint, the best thing is it's going to work right away. You know, different than how you saw in this example. Now let's fast over to car number seven, his last car. Now he buys the last car at year 38 when, when he's age 73. Now, do you know any 73 year old still driving around and maybe buying cars? I know some people who, who, who were that age and they, they bought their car and, and, and they told me this was gonna be the last car, but. I don't agree with that. So a client of mine, they started their first policy. Husband was age 81 and they met with me and they said, we're going to build a system for the purpose of buying our last car. They called it the last car. And I said, well, if insurance company approves you in life insurance policy, you're going to be in plan for a long time. So don't think about this being your last car. But the good thing is we're going to build your system to finance the doesn't matter how many cars you need going forward, right? So this is in the expand the program. They took additional three policies on their grandkids. So if someone on the webinar thinks they're too late into this, well, I don't think so. You're not late. It's it's all about how we think. Now let's fast over to 873. So premiums, they haven't paid any premiums after the first seven years. So starting year eight, they, they haven't paid any premiums. The policies actually paid the premiums. Now you can see at 873, the cash value has significantly increased to $621,000. So at age 73, the cash value is $621,000. And let's just say they want to retire at this time. 
So did they build a system from age 37 or age 36 all the way till age 73, not just for the purpose of buying cars, but also to be retirement ready? Are they pretty close to retirement ready now? I think they are. Would you agree? Type in Y in the chat box. And all they did was build a system for the purpose of buying cars. That's all they did. Now, that benefit now is $977,000. So you can see that that benefit has gone up because the dividend became more than the premium that was required. And then that accelerated the debt benefit going forward. So go, getting closer to projected mortality, they're in a much better, stronger estate protection too for the family because they started at $490,000 in debt benefit. And now the debt benefit is almost a million bucks, right? Plus all the money that they can spend at retirement. So let's buy the last car. Now, all right, well, you know, what, what, you, what we're going to do is we're going to actually do a tally on, on all the seven cars they have purchased in this system. And the formula hasn't changed. So cost of buying seven cars is basically money in for all the seven cars that they paid to the insurance company and money out for all the seven cars that they have uh, financed from their policy. So money in for all the seven cars. So remember, the premium was paid for the first seven years. So 20000 per year for seven years. And then they just paid the loan policy loans back on all the seven cars, which was 6000 per year for six years. That was a loan repayment for each car. And because they bought seven cars, we're going to multiply that by seven. So 140000 was the premium. And this is how much they paid back as a loan for all seven cars. So total money that they gave the insurance company is 392000 for seven cars to finance everything from the system. That's money in. Now let's calculate money out. So the money out to buy all seven cars, so cost of cars, so 30,000 multiplied by seven. So the money out for seven cars is $210,000. That's how much they took out as policy loans to buy seven cars. So again, let's go back to our formula. Formula is money in minus money out. So the cost of buying cars, money in minus money out. So 392,000 minus 210,000, that's 182,000. This is the real cost of buying seven cars using the process of becoming a banker. Now let's go and check how much cash values they have in the policy when they're done buying the last car or paying back the loan on the last car, which is the seventh car. So 873 is when they purchased their so-called last car. And by the time 877 came because they took... Uh, time to pay by policy loans. So at 877 is, is when they uh, paid their last policy loan back for the car. So this is the cost of buying car, $182,000. And then this is their cash value, $751,000. So if I take $751,000 and divided by $182,000, let's see what happens. $751,000 divided by $182,000, that, that fraction is 4.12 or 412%. So basically, over the life cycle of car financing, using the process of becoming a banker, for every dollar that they spent on cars, <clears throat> they have access to 412% of that dollar. Or for every dollar, they created access to $4.12. And retirement ready, and that benefit, and the use of seven cars, and they probably sold those cars for some value also. So that's all the unseen that's happening behind. Now, this transaction over the life cycle of buying cars, was this transaction similar to what you experienced through the bank, which is stress, anxiety, fear, if the interest rates changes, things changes, confusion, uncertainty, or change in plan? Or was it actually the complete opposite of all that? Yep, don't be shy. We can put that in the chat box. Now, is there anything wrong with stress-free way of living? I'm, I'm generally asking everybody a question. Is there anything wrong in stress review of living? This example was on cars, but will the outcome be any different if it was used for financing anything that you need from business equipment standpoint, from investment, for paying off debt, for sending your kids to education, to, to college and university for education, the transaction stays the same. I just took one of the most common commodity that everybody needs and everybody relates with so that I created a session on that. But... The, the process is the process is, is the money could be used for anything that you need money for. The, the transaction is not going to change. So life cycle of car financing, just summarizing it from age 35 to age 77, cost of financing cars, $182,000. That's what it costed them. They are retirement ready now with 
the, the ability to buy those cars and do all the great things and the cash value is a seventy fifty one thousand dollars so is it okay to spend one hundred eighty two thousand have the use of seven cars maybe resell those cars and create seventy fifty one thousand dollars in in future capital that can be used for retirement and all the growth has been tax free in addition to that the debt benefit is now a million bucks so if they if they live a long life do you think they did okay using the process of becoming a banker with the opportunity to just reuse and recycle all the money that's growing and if they die prematurely or if they die at some some point do you think the family did okay from the debt benefit which was there on a side measure so think about it and if they would have financed all those cars somewhere else would that have created the same outcome that you see presently? They're going to finance cars anyways. They just prioritized it with doing research, educating themselves, working with an authorized infinite banking practitioner to do it through the system. And they weren't, they're not going to do this alone. We're going to be there every step of the way, coach them, show them if they need to. We, we're happy to meet with clients for any strategy session. Now have the banking function on things you finance work for you versus against you. And as time goes by, economy progresses, economy regresses. Stock market goes up, stock market goes down. Real estate goes up, real estate goes down. Interest rates go up, interest rates go down. One thing continues no matter what. Any guesses what that one thing is? Is the process called banking. That continues <clears throat> no matter what. And someone has to control that banking function in your life, and it should be you. Or who else should it be? The best way to do it is by becoming your own banker. That's the best way to do it. All right? You create a stress-free way of living by taking back control from the banks, from manipulative stock market, from the government. Now, if you Google SNN Financial, there's, there's different Google location. This is something I picked from Edmonton location and Toronto location. This was actually a few months back. So the value numbers have increased. So think about this. Can an agency get five-star Google reviews for selling life insurance? No. The reason why we get all those amazing reviews and feedback from clients is because of the process of becoming a banker, which we teach them on once they become a client. As, uh, and then there's no limitation on how many time we have to meet to discuss strategies. We love talking to clients about the implementation of the process and, and go to any location and, and just pick any review and, and you will see real people leaving real experience working with us. So text the word. So I said, hey, we're going to be we're going to invite you to have that discussion so that you can talk about how this works for you. A, do not bring any money to that call. There's no money required. There's no commitment for you to become a client or for us to take you on a client. It's just a meeting for, for us to meet and, and A, answer some of the questions that would have come up for you and see how we can add value to what you want to get accomplished using this process personally and corporately. The, the best thing that can come out of that meeting is you'll, you'll leave the meeting with some more value, right? So text the word schedule to 780-809-4599 and you can select a day, a date and time where, where you want to meet. It's just that when you meet, make sure that we, 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 we're we going to give you undivided attention, but make sure that you also, you know, only present in that meeting. Let's not have any distractions because we want to make sure that meeting is the best use of your time. I will leave you with this. I think you guys can read it. Uh, in the event of, or in the times of instant coffee, instant tea, instant this, instant that, there's no such thing as instant gratification. Right. So patience is a virtue. Virtue is grace. Put this together and make a big smiley face. Right. You deserve a stress free, stronger financial future. Right. So text the word schedule to 780 809 4599 and schedule a time that works best for you and myself and my team. We're looking forward to having that discussion with you. And with that, I'm going to invite my team just to help with some questions that would have come up. I'm going to drink some water. Sorry, but awesome job. That was great. Can we can we just get some uh, 1 to 10 on the chat for how much value Sorbo just brought to us? If we can get a 10 for absolute value 
and one being not so much value. But let's let's I think we're gonna see a lot of tens. Oh yeah. Thanks again, Sorbo. That was awesome. It was my pleasure. Buying cars is my favorite topic. You guys know have no idea how much I've lost on cars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we all have, right? So love to hear about why why you love to teach people using uh cars so that they and why you love it so much. Oh man. Uh so I've I've purchased so right after college school. So I went to school to be an engineer and and I thought that was going to be my life. And until I discovered this process and everything changed, changed for me from, from what I want to do in life from fulfillment standpoint, right? So so out of college, you know, I, I was earning really good income and I ended up buying a really nice car. I'm not going to say which, which one. It was just really nice. And as I discovered this process, I was, I was mad at myself because I wanted things instant and I couldn't wait. So I ended up financing car from a third party and my payment was 800 bucks per month. It was a really nice car. And the worst thing that I did was leased because someone told me, hey, if it's a liability, lease it. Don't finance it. And I ended up spending so much money leasing that car. And at the end of lease term, I just enjoyed the car, got an experience and got nothing else from it. And and when I was introduced to this process, I was just mad at me because when I did the math on how much were those payments over the four-year lease, I think. So $800 a month, $9,600 a year in, in, in four years, let's just say $10,000 per year. That was $40,000 that I just spent and I got nothing from it. And when I sat and did the cost of loss opportunity, oh my God, I just fall off my chair. And that was my first car. And then I didn't discover the process of becoming a banker until my second car. So I was two cars in when I discovered the process. So, so again, think about all the cars that you're going to finance in your lifetime and, and, and how different would it be financially if you just change how you finance so that you're still able to enjoy the cars and do all the things that you want to do. But you also have the wealth being built up simultaneously. It didn't take away any of your options. If you do it through the system, it just gave you more options. And then this particular client, yes, I just showed transactionally he was buying cars, but if an opportunity came up for him to buy investments, they were still cash ready available for him to go buy investments. He could have done so many things as he was building up his system, right? You know, one of the most common things, and uh, I won't speak on my profession as a CPACA, the most common uh, example you'll hear is to, <laughs> your car <laughs> because you can get a business deduction yeah. but now you get it from the vantage point of an authorized infinite banking practitioner and especially with what you showed tonight you actually got a chance to show you're spending all this money and people are buying as we saw lots of cars if you actually reflect it back to how much you actually have in your retirement and savings I'm sure the amount that you spent in cars is probably higher than what you have in savings so creating your own banking system and utilizing it i think is absolutely awesome in terms of what you showed tonight sarbo oh thank you now how many cars do you think are parked on average family driveway two to three i'm saying two to three like i, I drive around my neighborhood i see cars i see rv i see bikes and I was like, I hope they're financing this from their family banking system. I was like, can I just get some leaflets? And I just want to put those on the cards and say, you're missing on an opportunity finance it from the system, right? So, yeah. And, and, and then if you're not, let's just say you're not looking to buy any cars. You know, let's just say that that's what it is. But someone in your family, maybe your child, your daughter, your son is driving a car which is not paid for. And someone is getting their payments. Shouldn't those payments flow back into the family banking system? Can you not create a family bank to take over those stream of payments? Now, if you extend your imagination and if you take it over for the car payments, can you take it over for the student debts? Can you take it over for other debts that they have? Can you take over the mortgage debts going forward? This is unlimited. That's why Nelson called it the infinite banking concept. Sarbul, a question that comes up for me is, Nelson talks about how IBC is a it's a exercise in logic, reason, and imagination. 
So for you practicing it at, for seven and eight years now almost, how has your imagination grown and how are you able to see so many more different ways that IBC can be used? Like, for example, what you showed us today, right? Could you walk us through that? Yeah. So, see, it's it's interesting. You know, you, you get those Eureka moments regarding what you can use the system for at the time of the day when you least expect it. For, for me, for some reason, it's always 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Like that's when I get the Eureka light bulb moment saying, oh, I can use it for this. So, so yes, car financing, investment financing is something I, I do use my policies for. But but I also started using policies for the purpose of, let's just say I want to buy goods and services, right? We all need goods and services. And I, I look at opportunities where I can pay a lump sum for, for someone's goods and services in exchange for a discount. And, 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 and doing that is also earning a rate of return. I'll give you an example. So, you know, we still rent and I tried this with my new landlord. He <laughs> didn't agree, but I'm working with it. But with my previous place where I was renting, my, my rent was 1800 bucks a month. Uh, and then you know, over a 12 month period, that's like 21,600 per year. That's how much I was paying on rent. So, you know, I built some relationship with the landlord and, and we, we always rent for long term. So I asked the landlord when the lease came up for renewal, which was November 1st, I said, hey, Mr. Landlord, I'm going to renew this for another year. Uh, but if I pay you the rent for the full year, will it help you financially? That was my first question. And he said, yeah, 100%, it's going to help me financially. I said, great. Then may I ask, what discount are you going to offer me in exchange for that? Because I want to make a win-win deal. And, and his response, well, he was quiet for like almost a minute. It's like a pregnant pause because he hadn't, he didn't know what to say. And then he came back and said, hey, I'm just going to have to discuss it with my wife, but I'll get back to you. Nobody asked me this question, so I need some time to think about it. I said, yeah, go ahead. Take your time to think about it. If your answer is no, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll book a psychiatric evaluation if you know, I'll pay for it. Right? I'll just jokes apart, right? So he, he he went to his wife, came back, and he said, Sir Oblo, if you pay me the rent for the full year, I'm going to reduce your rent to 1500 bucks a month from $1,800. So from 21,600 per year, it came down to $18,000. I took a policy loan and I paid him the rent for the full year. He has no idea how I did it. I was, I was trying to teach him on this process. He just didn't get it, right? Now the payment that I was making on a monthly basis to him for rent, that 1800 bucks per month doesn't have to leave my family for rent anymore. I just took that payment, a portion of it to pay by policy loans. And I took the difference and I cranked up another policy. So I was still able to provide for my family a roof above us. But just by asking questions differently, I was able to accomplish more objective. You know, I, I read it somewhere. It said, you know, smart people always have the answers. But genius people always have good questions. So I am purposely asking myself more questions so that I can I can change my thinking about how I'm thinking about solving for that particular objective. And then for some reason, I, I get some really good answers, right? So that's just method to my madness. And I would encourage everybody to do that. And, and one book that I would recommend everybody is, is going to be this book. It's called The Road Less Stupid. You like the title? These two books have changed my life. <laughs> this first, this later. So always just thinking about, you know, how can we make this transaction more effectively working in our favor versus someone else? Because again, in life, payments are not going to change. You have to use money to buy the goods and services going forward. Those payments are not going to change. But you can certainly change who's going to get your payments. And that's your behavior. And if you don't change, if, you, if nothing changes, then nothing changes. You know, Sarblo, I, I'll say personally for me, um, going through this process for quite a number of years now, you've definitely got a lot more years on top of me. On and I know Dan does too. And I don't know if you're comfortable sharing with this, but um, there were a lot of people asking about numbers and seeing these premium sizes, like, oh, they're so large and everything. Do you mind sharing a little bit of kind of your story on maybe a policy that just showed the importance of getting started and how how it started for you absolutely so so my my first policy was five thousand dollars per year as premium that is where i got started 
An interesting story. I was relocating back to the city of Edmonton from Saskatoon. And during that relocation, CRA gave me some money back, $5,000. By the way, CRA had to put someone to audit, making sure that this was a legit move. I was like, it costed you more money to pay me money back. Like, like anyways, so I got that $5,000 back. And, and that's basically the money that I used to got to get started. This is back in 2016. Now, my second policy was $2,400 per, per year, um, and that's what I could do. I had some passive income uh, assets at that time, which were producing me uh, some, some cash flow. So the $5,000 was from CRA, and then going forward, I was going to you know continue putting the premium in from my real estate investment. And then the second policy that I started for $2,400, that also came from my real estate in investment at that time. These two policies were literally uh, seven months apart or eight months apart. And then fast forward to today, I've used these policies for some great things for my family, like travel, family vacation, you know, property taxes, things like that, maintenance of my investment properties, covering some repairs on my investment properties, some vacancies on my investment properties, uh, paying for, you know, like in insurance products on, on tenant insurance, investment insurance. So these policies just became a source to finance all that. And it wasn't until 2018 that I started my first big policy of $20,000 because I understood with clarity that my money has to sit somewhere. And if I wanted to control bigger banking function in my life, I just had to expand my program. And it was intentional. You have to be intentional with it. You already have the money. It's just sitting in someone else's bank. You just have to change the address of that money and gradually move it into your bank. But everybody starts differently. You know, we have clients who put a couple of hundred bucks per month into it. We have clients who put six figures a year into it. They're all in different phases of life. But here's the best part. Doesn't matter where you start. You're going to like it. You're going to love it. Do you know why? Because it's going to work right away. And if you don't start, you're still going to, you're not going to have an opportunity to recapture those stream of payments forever. Yeah, I liked it. I'm just going to build off that servo for a minute. And because I started with a very similar policy to that smaller one, less than 6,000 a year. But, you know, the nice thing I I look at how much money I flow through that one little policy. And, and today I could use it to buy a really nice car. So it takes time. And depending on where you start, if you start smaller, it'll take you a little longer, build up enough capital to do bigger things. And then, yeah, you just, once you see what you, you didn't see as you just start to use this, you go, okay, how do I, how do I find a way to put more premiums in? Because the premiums are the solution. They're not the problem. Yep. You know, isn't it interesting when banks become profitable, they open more branches. Money goes on branches. <laughs> so there must be a reason to their behavior. And if you're thinking like a banker, if you're not thinking like a banker, well, then I would encourage you to start thinking like a banker. So put yourself in the shoes of a banker. When your policy is able to, once one policy is able to do the things that the policy was designed to do, and, and it's, it's profitable business going forward, but it's not able to do everything, which means it's time to expand. Again, all your income, if you just think logically, right, all your income is flowing to the books of someone else's bank, and you're okay with it. Can you start by flowing 5% of your income through your bank and then build it to 10%, 15%, 20%, gradually 30%, 40%, and ultimately 100%? It's it's gonna it's not gonna happen overnight, but it is gonna happen. It will happen if you want it to happen. We so in my family, because we've been doing this for longer, uh, you know, we don't rely on 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 any bank for the purpose of financing because we've been very intentional with what we want to do. I didn't start using policies for the purpose of investing until like three or four years into my program because I was very intentional with investment, sorry, with, with policy capitalization and wanted to have a certain cash value before I was able to access money for the purpose of investment. Hey, I'm, I'm here today and I'm able to do all the great things today. People want instant everything. Like I mentioned, um, anything worthwhile is, any, anything worthwhile is it's just worthwhile. You got to wait. Think about how long Amazon took to become profitable. 
imagine Jeff Bezos waking up one day and saying, I just wanted to create profit tomorrow. And I started yesterday. Think about Apple, how long Apple took to become profitable. Think about all the great companies that you already are aware of and how long. Think about how long banks took to become profitable. Why is your expectation different from everybody else then? So it will happen. In, in sorry, if um in the beginning when you first started, if you can kind of go back to that mindset there, what was a what was a challenge that you had to overcome, or what was a way you had to rethink some of your thinking when you first discovered IBC? Oh man, I, I was an engineer, and I'm I call myself a recovering engineer now. <laughs> man, I got so hung up on numbers. That's where my brain went. I, I basically so I got Nelson's book, and I was like, okay, let's go back, let's go straight to the table of values. That's basically what I read. And you know what came up from that? All I know is numbers. It's like going to Home Depot and wanting to buy a drill. And all you know are the features of the drill, but you didn't do the homework on the benefits of the drill. That's what happened with me. And then I started pepper spraying my coach on this whole, in, in this whole number game. And you, you guys may be thinking about that. And my coach just sat me down and said, Serbro, I'll answer you all your question if you can answer my first question and first question alone. And if you can't answer this, then this meeting is over. I said, okay, what's your question? And he said, just describe to me the problem that Nelson talks about in his book that we solve by implementing the process in our life. And that moment, I started thinking differently. Sometimes it just takes one intelligent question to, to start thinking differently. And then you're like, man, I, I, I didn't, I don't, I don't know. Like, I was like, put money into policy, take money out, buy things, pay money back. Is this the problem? He's like, no, the problem is you're doing all the work and everybody else is getting all their money. And if you understand that, then the process of becoming a banker is clear. And if you don't understand it, go back and read the book. And there's plenty of numbers in the book. There's plenty of numbers to get crazy. And analysis paralysis, right? Yeah, it's possible. It doesn't help. I know that. And I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm stating that as an engineer. What, what they taught me is it's just different. And it took me time to, 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 to really change how we think about things going forward. Everything begins with how we think. That's, that's, that's the root of the problem. Any questions came up in the Q and A that we should share with the benefit uh, for the benefit of uh, people who are still with us? Our team did a pretty good job of answering most of them. Team, anything oh, that came up in the in the chat for you guys in the Q and A box? There's just a gentleman that asked a question that is a very common question. If this is so great, why why doesn't everybody have infinite banking? No. <laughs> Why don't well, we know about this? How come nobody taught me? Yeah, well, think about who you surround yourself with. You have the answer right there. People who understand this, they do it. Well, who's the biggest purchaser of a participating dividend paying whole life policy in your mind? Who do you think buys these policies in a boatload and puts millions of millions of premium into it per year? It's the people, banks. the banks. banks, banks do that. But people who put a lot of money into these policies are the people who actually need the life insurance the least. It's the wealthy. They must know something that we don't. But the other people who put a lot of money in is are, are the banks. It's called Bully Bank on Life Insurance. If one day you have a hard time sleeping, just Google Bully and sit still and look at that number, you will sleep right away. <laughs> <laughs> why is everyone not doing it because the only limitation that is being set is actually them it's unfortunately yeah. just not a fit for for them if they're too consumed and distracted by something else well if the majority of the people sorry if the minority of the people in the world 
control and accumulate wealth, then why do we have to do what the majority do financially? Something to think about. If today we look, we, we get together all the money on planet Earth, it's going to be a lot of money. And then we redistribute that money equally amongst everybody on planet Earth. So everybody has equal money. Within a matter of few years, all that money would come back into that minority of people again. Because they have figured out how to have money flowing towards them versus away from them. Sarbo, in, in, in closing, maybe just as a final question to end off, uh, for anybody that's new on the call that it does want to schedule to become your own banker call with us, what does the process look for them afterwards? Yeah, I would have anybody in the team want to share what 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 is the, uh, the, the prospect client journey looks like with the team who, who wants to chime in to answer that question. Everybody's jumping up at once. Yeah, everybody's excited yeah. to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, uh, yeah, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump into that. So, yeah, if you're interested in, in learning more about this, well, you know, you just use that number to schedule a call. So, you'll meet with one of us, and we're just going to ask you some questions just to get a good sense as to what you've learned, what you st still have for questions, and you know, we're going to direct you towards information. You know, one thing, you know, you'll find right away is we just ask that, you know, education's on you. We're there to coach you. So we'll get you through those uh, that first meeting and into a second one. If it looks like uh, this is something that is a fit for you and we'll have, you know, one or two meetings. If it's something you decide to do, we're going to put you through an application because until you get an offer from the life company, well, you, you know, you don't know what you have. So we'll walk you through that process help you as you go through it make sure you get all your questions answered get you in front of uh, one of the life companies and see if we can get you an offer and after that you get to decide whether you want to settle it and after that that's when the work starts once you get a policy in place that's when the work starts we coach you on implementation that's at a high level who else wants to add to that Yeah, um, what, what I can say to that, Dan, is all and all you have to commit is your time for that process and your willingness to learn and to be coachable and to have an open mind throughout that process, asking the right questions and um, and, and just keeping an open mind and, and having the having the uh, the willingness to to rethink your thinking as you process the information throughout that process. Yeah, I would say, you know, nobody has ever been injured, hurt, going through a process. They've already, they've always enjoyed it. That's the feedback that we get. <laughs> and, you know, when it comes to making a decision to proceed, you know, in terms of next step, you know, that's going to be a mutual decision between the prospect client and us, because our relationship is is a lifelong relationship. It's not transactional. You know, it's not about, hey, here's a policy, hope you cut there. Call me in 40 years and let me know how you buy all those seven cars, you know, that's not the objective. This is going to be brand new to you. You need help. You need support. You need coaching. You need guidance. You need accountability. That's the key. And that's what we are going to provide you. But at the same time, we can't be more vested in, in doing this than, 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 than you. It, it has to come from you. And then, then that's how we, we do things going forward. And, and go check out some, some Google reviews that we have. Uh, if this is your first time being, being exposed to a team. <laughs> 